Uh, the Ten Commandments, which are also called the Moral Law and the Decalogue, just for the Old Testament people and just for the Old Testament dispensation, or is it relevant for today and for modernity? Well, Jesus said it is for today. He said this, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And Paul says the law is relevant for today as well. He said in Romans 7, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Now, I ask you a question today because I don't want there to be any confusion at all as we finish up our series on the relevancy of the moral law back in Exodus chapter 20. Is the law the means of earning the way into heaven? Is the law, the Ten Commandments, is it the way if we keep it? If we do that, does that earn us heaven if we can keep it? Well, of course, I would say definitely not. Paul tried to be a do-it-yourselfer, as many people are doing in the world today in which we live. And that means to earn salvation by keeping the law. And he found that his works didn't work in getting him to heaven. Paul said this. He said that he counted them and that is all of his religious works, all of his efforts to keep the law, all of his efforts to just dot every I and cross every T. He said, I've counted them as rubbish. And he was referring to his own personal efforts when he really came to know what the gospel was and who it was that saved him. So we go back to the very first message today and ask the question, what then is the purpose of the Ten Commandments for the Christian. If it's for us today, if it wasn't just for Israel, if it wasn't just for that old dispensation, if it is for us today, then what kind of purpose does it play in our lives? And we mentioned three things that I'll rehearse again today. First of all, the law functions as a strip search. That's what happens when you go into the doctor's office. There's a strip search that takes place if you have a full physical. And the Word of God is just like this, or like that. It examines us and drives us to see our need for Christ as the means of salvation. Secondly, the law functions as a preventative, as a strip search, as a preventative. It restrains us from engaging in evil. So it's like kind of a hand there that's inside because the law is written in our hearts. It's in the Word of God. God has put it here, and it kind of is there, and it kind of just pricks that conscience. It kind of says, whoa, back. Hold it. Shouldn't go there. Don't do that. Be careful what you say. What's your motives in this? And the law very much is like that. It functions as a preventative. It restrains us from engaging in evil. Third thing the law does is this. The law functions as a guidepost. It outlines, it outlines how our thinking, motives, and behavior are to please God. So if we want to know how to please God, Look at the Ten Commandments. If we want to know how to deal with people, look at the Ten Commandments, because the first half of the commandments has to do with God, how to please Him. The last half of the commandments, the Ten Commandments, has to do with how to please God and please other people and, and the way we should treat them. Now, I want to take a complete right turn from that, so keep that in mind, but it's fitting in with what we're talking about today, because of this particular, particular subject, aiming for a perfect lifestyle. That's my subject today. Aiming for a perfect lifestyle. You've got to be kidding, preacher. Nobody can be perfect. But what did we just read this morning on the screen? You must therefore be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So I'm not on ba off base, Evelyn, when I say that. Not at all. So... Let's consider this. A person becomes a Christian by becoming, not by the meritorious work of the law, but by being born again, by experiencing a new spiritual 
Genesis. You know what the book of Genesis is? It means beginnings. That's what it means. Genesis means beginnings. And so when I say spiritual Genesis, I'm actually saying when a person becomes a Christian, it's a spiritual Genesis. It's a spiritual, new spiritual birth that they experience. And in theology, we call it, it's a big term, it means monergistic. Mono means one. Erg in Greek is work. So it means one work. So salvation then is a God job. It's the work of God. God, without my help, makes me a new person. Monergism. But once we are a Christian, once we bow at the foot of the cross and by faith receive Jesus Christ into our life as our Savior, as our Lord, our Master, the one that calls the shots, and as our treasure, the one that we love more than anyone else, that's why I like to put it that way. That's really what happens when we come to Christ. If we don't come to Christ in that way, I don't think we're really coming to Christ. We come to Him as our Savior from our sins, as our Lord to now be the master of our life, and our treasure, the one that we are going to value above everything else in this world that we have. So once we are Christians, we live a different lifestyle that involves a holy, righteous life. And if a Christian isn't producing that, now for periods of time we do go through times where we are unholy, where we find ourselves face down in the mud. We know that. But if it just persists, then I would say you've got to wonder if that person really is a Christian or not. So again I say this, once we are a Christian, once we become a Christian by faith in Jesus Christ, relying upon Him for our salvation to get us into heaven, we live a different lifestyle that involves a holy, righteous life. And what we call this is sanctification. And sanctification basically is stripped in two ways. Number one, it means set apart unto God. In other words, we are His here on out. But it also means separated from sin and the world in which we live. There's a lot more to it than that. There's actually positional sanctification and perfect sanctification and practical sanctification, but I won't get into all that this morning. Those are kind of the details of sanctification. But sanctification, different than being born again, which is monergistic, is synergistic. Synergistic, a word made up of two different words again, which oftentimes the Greek words are. And it means a two-person operation. So salvation, coming to Christ, is a one-person operation. It's a God job. But sanctification, being a Christian, living the Christian life, doing a different lifestyle, is a two-person operation. God and I work together so that I can grow in holiness and righteousness. Now, it's still heavy in his part and lighter in my part, but just the same. Salvation, whether it's coming into Christ to be born again, is a God job. And my sanctification, in many respects, is a God job too, because the Bible says that he's the one that actually grows us. I can't grow myself. I can't make myself a better Christian, but I cooperate with him in order to make that take place in my life as a child of God. So God and I work together, that sanctification, synergism, God and I work together so that I can grow in holiness and righteousness. Those then who are Christians are more moral in their lifestyle than people of the world, or they're not Christians. And they're more moral than those who are trusting in their morality to get them to heaven. Every religion, barring Christianity represented here by the cross, every religion in the world, Buddhism, Confucianism, cults, Mormonism, all of them, I don't care what they are, Buddhism, just name them, call them out. Any kind of idolatry is definitely a works type righteousness where we are trying to merit from God all that we can, stack up our do's and don'ts and hope in the end that we're going to make it to heaven. That's how the religions of the world are. And that's why we have preached oftentimes and said, um, you've got really what is called the religion of the scales. You can picture what an old scale was like, you know, with the two things here and you put your weights on it and which weight goes down and all that kind of thing. It was used for measuring and dealing with money and all of that back in the old days. But what you find is that Christianity is one side 
and all the world religions are on the other. All of them are. And all of them on the other side of Christianity, all of them believe in earning salvation by their own doing. Keeping God's law, keeping some kind of law so that they will be accepted by God. And that is totally rejected. So again, I want to say, those who are Christians are more moral in their lifestyle than people in the world, or they're not Christians, and more moral than those who are trusting in their morality to get them into heaven. Sinners, sinners, and we all are sinners, but sinners live in a realm of sin, nothing but sin. And I'm speaking of someone that isn't a Christian, someone that's never bowed their knee to Christ and given their heart to him and experienced the new birth that changes us from center to circumference. Sinners live in a realm of sin, nothing but sin. They can never please God in word, third, thought, or deed. Never, never. In Christians, after we become a Christian, sin remains, but it doesn't reign and rule. There's a big difference. Whereas in a non-Christian's life, sin reigns. It's nothing but sin. But in the Christian's life, while sin remains and we're growing and developing out of that, becoming better from that, yet still sin remains, but it doesn't reign, control, rule in our lives. Now, that's just the introduction to the message today, okay? So we want to get into our text, which is two verses that I'm going to fuse together. Matthew 5.20 and verse 48. Let me read them to you now. 5.20 says this. Jesus has just talked about the need for the law being relevant today. And he says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never, never enter the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 48, the last verse in the chapter. You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So that's the heart of what I want to really look at today. And we're going to take those two verses and put two headings to them, and those will be the two points for the message this morning. First of all, I want you to notice the prerequisite to moral perfection, and that's verse 20. The prerequisite. What is the prerequisite to moral perfection? What has to go before moral perfection? Verse 20 reads again, For I tell you, Jesus said, Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The prerequisite, the first one, is imputed righteousness. That's the first one. Imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness, what is that anyway? It's being blameless before God. It means God no longer considers you guilty anymore. It means that you have an alien righteousness, a foreign righteousness. We don't come by it naturally. We can't produce it ourselves. It's all of God, totally. So when you and I trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior and Lord, God contributes to us the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah for that. You cannot be a Christian unless that takes place, unless that righteousness of Christ is put to your account, attributed to you as an individual. So here it is. Our sinful condition that we have as a sinner is exchanged for Jesus' righteousness. This is what it says in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21. And I'm going to kind of slip some little words in there to help you to understand it. It says, For our sake, that is the sake of the sinner, he, that is God, made him, that is Jesus, to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him, that is Jesus, we the sinner might become the righteousness of God. So let me read that verse again. Here it is. For our sake, that is the sake of the sinner, God made Jesus to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Jesus we the sinner might become the righteousness of God. That is imputed righteousness front and center. It really is. So the main thing is you can't, Jesus says, Jesus says the main thing is you can't enter the kingdom of heaven without having imputed righteousness. If you don't have imputed righteousness, then you cannot be a Christian and you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. 
It's a righteousness. Imputed righteousness is, it's a righteousness you don't earn or deserve, but comes from God having grace and mercy upon you. That's all it is. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. We can't get it ourselves. It's a gift of God as salvation is, not of works lest any man should boast, the Bible says in Ephesians 2. So it's a righteousness you don't earn or deserve, but it comes from God having grace and mercy upon you. And that's what Paul said when he wrote to Titus in chapter 3, verses through 4 through 5. He said, but when, the right, but when the goodness and loving kindness of our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, that is, keeping the law, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of re regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit. So you with me? Here it is. The prerequisite to moral perfection before we can strive for moral perfection, first of all, there has to be imputed righteousness. That's the first prerequisite. But here's the second one. The second one. The second prerequisite is exceptional righteousness. Exceptional righteousness. Did you know what he said? What did he say? Well, Jesus said this. He said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, You'll never make it into heaven. You'll never be found in the kingdom of God. Exceptional righteousness. Imputed righteousness precedes exceptional righteousness. Imputed righteousness exceeds, I should say precedes, exceptional righteousness. And exceptional righteousness is an outgrowth of imputed righteousness. So when I have imputed righteousness, what grows out of that, if I've got imputed righteousness, is exceptional righteousness. This is important to see. It really is. Now, what is exceptional righteousness? That's the big question. What are we talking about when we speak of exceptional righteousness? Exceptional righteousness outstrips and outshines the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. That's what Jesus said. It exceeds them. That's an interesting word in the Greek. For example, refers to the overflow of a flooded river. So you get the picture when he says that your righteousness has got to exceed, which he means it's like a river overflowing. Your righteousness has literally got to overflow the banks in comparison to the scribes and the Pharisees. What is really interesting when you study church history and look at the history of the people of God and the, in the Word of God is this. And that is that before Israel's exile, and remember when I say exile, I mean when they were taken by the Assyrians and wiped out the north was, and then the south was wiped out by the Babylonians. Remember, Israel was just, they were gone. There were just a few people left back in Jerusalem. That's all eking out an existence. But before, before Israel's exile, before that happened, they were idolatrous. God had such a time with them. They were constantly turning back to idols, having them in their home, worshiping trees up on a hill. They had all kinds of these places. After the exile, when they came back from being exiled, being imprisoned in, in um, Babylon, they embraced a do-it-yourself salvation. Now, this is good to know why they had such problems with the law right there. It's when they came back from exile, they embraced a do-it-yourself salvation, a salvation that had the schemes of work and reward. And that's what the Pharisees and the scribes were really into. The scribes and Pharisees' religion was all external, was all show. Now, who were scribes? You know who scribes are. They were the scholars. They were men that really studied the Word of God and re-studied it and studied again. And they were scholarly. They were scholarly men. Pharisees were very strict. The very term has a sense of strictness. They were strict about their religion. A lot of scribes were Pharisees. And a lot of Pharisees were scribes, as far as that goes. But the two of them were kind of individuals that were very high up in Israel and looked upon with great regard. But the problem with them was this, they were hypocrites. Appearing outwardly holy, but inwardly they were unholy. And we find this in how they had tried to deal with their guilt and pollution. 
Everyone is, anyone, every one of us in here are born in this world depraved. And when we speak of depravity, we are speaking of individuals that are guilty before God. God's wrath is upon everyone's head. Judgment is coming. Hell is in the future unless that guilt is taken away. So they had that. How were they going to get rid of their guilt and the pollution of their lives? that they found in their lives, this fact that they, they found a real problem struggling with sin. Well, I just want to say this, they tried to expunge their guilt and pollution themselves by adding all kinds of laws. The law only required for the whole nation a fast once a year. And they said it's got to be twice a week. Why? Because by themselves they were trying to expunge their sin and pollution by exceeding what God even said. And of course, when it came to tithing, they tithed everything. They pulled a dill out of the, out of the garden and took part of it for the kingdom of God. They took mint and all of those different things, whatever it was, even a flower, anything. They tithed everything. God said you didn't have to do that. He had regulations but they went beyond it. What were they doing? They were trying to expunge their pollution and guilt. And the beautiful thing about it for the Christian is that that's only done in Jesus Christ. We can't do it ourselves. We can't get rid of this guilt. We can't get rid of this pollution that we've got. Only Christ can do it. But they never saw that whatsoever. They tried to do it themselves by all of these religious things that they added on to their lives. So they were hypocrites, appearing outwardly holy, but inwardly they were unholy. And they glorified in themselves and wanted people to admire them. Remember, we've said before, Jesus talked about it. He said that before they even could get to the synagogue, they would bow their heads on the corner and people would say, oh, look at that man of God. That's exactly, said Jesus, Jesus said, they've got their reward. They're trying to look holy. They're just hypocrites. That's what they are. In Matthew chapter, what is it, 21 or 22? He wheels against them. I mean, he throws at them a real bomb when he comes up with, whoa, whoa, seven times. He says, whoa, you Pharisees. Why? And he calls them hypocrites every time when he's dealing with them. So they gloried in themselves. How about you? We as Christians have got to be careful of that. Our spirituality, how far we are in Christ where we've come along, how we've been trained, all of that. We've got to be so careful, people in the ministry especially. They gloried in themselves, the scribes and Pharisees did, and wanted people to admire them. And I suppose you could say in a word they were motivated by selfishness. That's what it was all about, it really was. So Christian religion is very different than the scribes and the Pharisees. It originates from the heart. It's not an outward thing. It's from the inside. It's a big difference because something's happened inside with my guilt and, and pollution, so it's a heart thing. Christian religion originates from the heart. Its motivation comes from God himself. According to Jeremiah, way back in chapter 31 and verse 33, according to Jeremiah, the Jews didn't have a relationship to the Ten Commandments like Christians have. Why not? Well, here it is. Jeremiah said, he said, I will put my laws within them, and I will write it, write it on their hearts. Big difference. So exceptional righteousness, cutting down into it a little more, what does it mean? Well, exceptional righteousness means that you love God. How? with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. Matthew twenty two thirty seven. So exceptional righteousness loves God. You say, well, how in the world do I develop that anyway? Well, I want to say this, that somebody that really is going on and loving God is someone that just can't get enough of Him. They want more and more of Him. Their desires are for God. Check your life out on that. It's important. And not only that, but they can't wait every day. When they get into the Word, it's not just a duty, but it's a delight because as they get into their Bibles every day for their reading, when they get into it, they get into it to meet with God. They're just not reading words and say, well, 
I've, you know, checked it off. I've read this for today, and I'll read my Bible in a year this year because I'm checking it off. That's all duty. We've got to come to it with delight, and that delight is this, where I come to meet God in His Word. That's what I want to see. I want to see God in His Word. And if your devotions are really working for you, if you're growing spiritually, you're going to be meeting God in the Word. You're going to be seeing God in the Word, meeting God in the Word, and as a result, your life is going to be transformed. Your motives are going to be transformed. Your thinking is going to be transformed. Your emotions are going to be transformed. Your behavior is going to be transformed. So it's important to see, I think, that that's all a part of loving God. Loving God, you know, I can remember when... Um, we first met on the city bus in London. You get? We visited this week and I was sharing with her how we met. Met Cheryl on the city bus after an ice hockey practice. Now, we didn't meet at that time, but we looked at each other. You know how that goes, guys and girls. You kind of, oh, okay, I like what I'm seeing here. And then a friend introduced us. And it's interesting in a love relationship. You can relate to this. All of you can. It's a beautiful thing how it starts out just as a little seed and then it grows. It has a stem, becomes a beautiful flower. And you just can't get enough of each other. You know, you, you meet the person, you say, wow, I'd like to spend a little more time with that person. And then I'd like to spend a little more time with that person. I'd like to have a lot more of this person. And then you get married. And that same thing should be brought over into our relationship with God. It's just like that. Well, you can't get enough of Him. That's what it means to love God, just like that. And so the commandments are very much all about, the Bible is all about that great thing, and that is to love God. How? Well, with our whole being, with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Exceptional righteousness doesn't stop there, though. Exceptional righteousness not only is loving God, but exceptional righteousness loves your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, what's that all about? Well, let me from Scripture draw some things together here, okay, that I did yesterday. You return love for hatred. That's loving your neighbor. Forgiveness for meanness. Patience for trials and suffering. Prayer for persecutors reconciliation for broken relationships, thankfulness in all situations, rejoicing in the Lord always, contentment in all situations, putting others' interests before your own, putting humility in the place of selfish ambition and conceit, making much of Jesus and not yourself. That's how you love your neighbor. It really is. I tell you, I've been learning some more contentment this week. I preached on it a few weeks ago, and the Lord said, I'm going to teach you a little more this week. Our backyard is a mud hole. I just had it aerated and seeded the day before the storm hit. Guess what's happened to the seed? Guess what's happened to everything, how it's washed a lot of it away? Not only that, but my oldest dog, call it my collie, Abigail Bonnie Bell, quite a name, eh? It's Scottish. She has a bad back leg, and I have to help her down the back stairs, and I have to lift her back up. Well, guess where I have to go? She can't go down the front steps because we have eight at the front door. We've only got two at the back. So I have to let her down a number of times every day into the mud at the back because our back has a bit of a knoll, and from our neighbor Brian next door, who's assistant chief to pl of police, his water comes down right on my property. So our backyard is like a mud hole. You could get out there in your bathing suit and have a good fight, good wrestling match. You want to do it? Robert, you want to get out there? We'll get out there this week and have a good old tussle, you know, a good old mud wrestle. Well, I get out there with her, and I, first time this happened a couple of times, I was a real happy camper. Because every time I have to wash the dog's feet off and dry them off. And this happens a number of times every day. Contentment. Lord said, I'm going to teach you some contentment. going to move you along a little more on it. And that's what's happening. So now when I go out with her, I always <laughs> think of that verse of Scripture that Paul said, I've learned to be content. And I'm saying to myself, Bill, you're learning to be content. You're learning to be content by dealing with the dog in this particular way. 
Why do I say that? Well, just simply to say that all of these things that I have mentioned, you return love for hatred, forgiveness for meanness, patience for trials. You pray for your persecutors. You try to reconcile broken relationships. You're thankful in all situations, rejoicing in the Lord always, contentment in all situations, even your muddy backyard, and all of that. Loving our neighbor. That's what it means to love your neighbor. That's what it means to love your neighbor. Scholar Plummer, and he wasn't a plumber, but that was his name. Scholar Plummer said this, to return evil for good is devilish, I guess. To return good for good is human, but to return good for evil is divine. And that's what it means to love your neighbor. Just that very thing, just like that. So any religion, any religion, that doesn't possess imputed righteousness and exceptional righteousness will never enter the kingdom of heaven. So think about that, Christian. Just how are you progressing? How am I progressing in this exceptional righteousness? You say you've got imputed righteousness, and if you do, what grows out of that is exceptional righteousness. In other words, you're beyond others in your neighborhood other individuals of different religions, your righteousness is exceptional to what they're trying to do. Why? Because you've got imputed righteousness. That's why. So the two play together. They work together. They're in tandem as far as that goes. So that's the first thing we want you to notice this morning. Those two prerequisites to moral perfection. But now we move on to verse 48. The command, the command, the command for moral perfection Look at verse 48 again out of the text. Jesus said this as he's talking about the Ten Commandments. He says, you therefore must be teleos, that's a Greek word, perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's a tall bill of goods. That's a tall order for the Christian. You must be perfect. I mean, wow. That's quite a name. That's quite a goal. It really is. There's three things I want to mention about it. The first is this. What does the word perfection mean anyway? What does it mean? Do you have any idea? Well, it means the word teleos, having reached the goal. It means that. Like a football team winning the game and the championship. Like... <clears throat> Roll Tide did last year. <laughs> Happens to be Alabama. But it also, this word teleos means to finish one's work, such as someone sets out to write a book and completes it. The word means that. But then it has another edge to it, and that is to make mature, fully developed, like an immature boy developing into a mature man. It means that. So here the demand is to be perfect as God is perfect. How is moral perfection obtained? How do we get moral perfection anyway? Well, the moral law demands perfection. We know that. When he set out these Ten Commandments, he didn't say, uh, we'll do your best and I'll accept your best. Didn't do that doesn't say that anywhere. doesn't say that anywhere in Scripture at all. No, no. The moral law demands perfection. That's why Jesus died. Adam could have lived a sinless life. But he didn't. So the second Adam, as the Bible calls him, or the last Adam, Jesus Christ came along to do what the first Adam failed to do. The first Adam blew it. The second Adam kept the law perfectly, kept it perfectly. So it's only obtained by conversion, faith, and regeneration. Perfection is. It's only obtained by conversion, faith, and regeneration. And because we have a new heart by faith in Jesus, Jesus who kept the law perfectly attributes to us the perfection demanded. Isn't that wonderful? That's fantastic. That the perfection demanded by the law, 
Jesus Christ kept, and he kept it for us. He didn't need it. Oh, he didn't being the last Adam, but he was a perfect man himself. But he kept that law perfectly for us and attributes the perfection of that law to us that's demanded of us. So that's why in Romans chapter 8, for example, you've got that wonderful verse that says that he foreknew, he predestined, he called, he justified, he glorified. All of those particular words in the Greek or in the aorist tense, which means it's signed, sealed, and delivered. God seals it. It's done. The moment I'm saved, all of that is true in my life. That's a wonderful thing when you think about it. So there is positional perfection, but there's also practical perfection. And that leads me to the third thing, and that is, why then are we commanded to strive for moral perfection? Why did he say that? Why did he say it? Why did he say, like he says in verse 48, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. God is perfect, and we are to be like God. So why then are we commanded to strive for moral perfection? Do you have an answer for that? Because there should be. To be sure, the command is Christ's leash to keep us close to Jesus. I think that's a good reason. It's like a leash. Any of you know that it's not an easy thing to train a dog to walk beside you. They've got to know how to heal. They've got to know how to operate on a leash. And so you start them out as a puppy. And they jerk all over the place. For if one thing, they'll try to get the collar off. They'll try to pull in every direction. So what you do, you work with them and work with them to where you finally can walk along with them with that leash on and they just trot along like a perfect little pony. They really do. So the command to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect is like Christ's leash. Like Christ's leash. He's got us on a leash to keep us close to Jesus. That's a good reason for it. To strive for moral perfection is to strive for loving God and loving our neighbor, as the law says. That's what perfection is about. It's about loving God. And it's about loving our neighbor as ourselves. So Paul talked about the fact that the law is fulfilled in this word love. Love is wrapped up in the law. To love God and to love my neighbor. It's all wrapped up in it. It really is. So to strive for more perfection is to strive for loving God and loving our neighbor, as the law says. God is love. It's one of his qualities. It's one of his attributes. And it requires us to love too. Perfect love was demonstrated not when I got married or when you got married. It was love, but it wasn't perfect love. Why? Because two sinners got married. That's why. No, no. Perfect love was demonstrated when God gave his son for guilty, polluted sinners. That was perfect love. That's the standard for what love is all about right there. That's love. So Christians are called to imitate their heavenly father's love. Just like that. Our love should be unrestricted, right? Love without strings attached. If we're going to love perfectly, that's the goal. Loving our enemy who hates us. That's what it's all about. Loving those through prayer whose standards are terrible and wicked. <laughs> Cheryl and I have talked about this many times about the political system today. You know, how can you pray for those goons? How can you pray for them? All that wicked set out there that entered into same-sex marriage and homosexuality and transgender this and transgender... I mean, my goodness, it's crazy out there. It's absolutely weird as can be. There are so many titles now for sexuality, you can't even keep up with it. They're inventing it, it seems, every day. It's so ridiculous. We are to love them. We're to love those who... As we've seen over this political system with the judge coming on, all the things that have been undone and said, well, how do we love them? We pray for them. And one of the things we should pray for is not just their downfall and their defeat and the agendas to come down on their heads, but that they'll come to know Christ and repent of their sins. We should pray for them in that light. That should be the first prayer. And the second prayer should be then that God would 
cut them out of their knees and the agendas that they've got because they're wicked. So loving our enemy by giving him food and drink, buying their lunch. Jesus said, don't take vengeance on people. Don't people pay people back. He said, vengeance is mine. I'll repay, says the Lord. And he says, what you should do, leave it up to me. You go give them a drink of water. Go take them out to lunch. Give them something to eat. That's foreign. Shouldn't be foreign to Christians. It should be commonplace. That's exceptional righteousness. That's perfection to do that kind of thing. So loving even when it hurts and causes us to sacrifice. That's what it means to, to love our neighbor in that way. Love even when it hurts and causes us to sacrifice. Like when you've got a sister, for example, not mine, but when you've got a sister who will never call you and you're the one that always has to initiate it. There's a bit of sacrifice in that. But there's also love involved in it as well. There really is. And that's what we're to do when we're talking about loving our neighbor. So to strive for moral perfection is to strive every day to be sold out for Jesus. I guess I would say that that's the, the bottom line right there, what I'm saying now. To strive for moral perfection is to strive every day to be sold out for Jesus. Now, how do we do that? Talk to yourself every day when you get up. I do it. I've made a practice of it now for a while. Have a, f a pet scripture, a favorite scripture, that every day when you get out of bed, you say to yourself to start that day off. And another thing I would say and encourage you to do is just this. Getting upon the altar of sacrifice every day. Every day the Jews had to go out, had to get that animal, cut its throat, bleed it, pick it up, put it up on the altar, up on the altar of sacrifice, and then they had to cut it up into its various parts. And I just want to say when we're talking about being sold out to the Lord, there's got to be a sense in our heads where every day we talk to ourselves and we bring ourselves to that place every day where we, as it were, get up on that altar and say, Lord, I'm yours again today. No matter what happens, I'm yours. I'm your sacrifice. I'm your living, holy sacrifice today. What a difference that would make in your life and mine, wouldn't it? If we came to every day, like, instead of getting up and grumping about the little sleep I got or what happened or what I've got to do and this telephone call that, you know, so many of us are no different than unsaved people when it comes to that. We are to be different. We really are exceptional. So let me say again, to strive for moral perfection is to strive every day to be sold out for Jesus. Now, it almost goes without saying. We will never in this life reach perfection, but it remains our goal to progress in holiness and righteousness with great passion and zeal. If anyone, <laughs> I would say, could have earned his way into heaven, it would have been Paul the Apostle. Don't you agree? When you read Philippians chapter 3 and you look at his life, it's amazing. He tried so hard. But Paul confesses that with all his effort, he had not reached perfection, even after he'd become a Christian. And you know when he writes Philippians, he's not a little young dodger then. He's an older man. He perhaps was soon going to be facing death at the hands of the Romans. And so as he writes this, after what I've been talking about, being every day getting up, putting himself on the altar, sold out to God, he still says this, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect. He said, no, no, that's my aim, but I press on to make it my own. And that's our supercharged effort that he's talking about here. It's like when I used to run sprints. I used to be a sprinter. I wasn't a distance runner. Still, I'm not. I do 31 minutes in the treadmill, and there's another lady I know over there, and she, she actually makes this machine stop. She goes so far. They have to reset it for her. This happens every day. I only go 31 minutes. That's all I can take. I was a sprinter where you get into the block and zoom, you're gone. 
for 100 yards or 200 yards, whatever it is. And I always was trying to what? Better my goal, reach my goal. I always tried to beat someone that was ahead of me. That's the way it is in the Christian life. That's what we're talking about when we talk about perfection. So like Paul says, he confesses that all his effort in the Christian life to become perfect, he hasn't reached perfection yet. When he says, not that I've already obtained this or I'm already perfect, that's my aim, that's what I'm after, that's what I'm gung-ho for. And he says how he's gung-ho. I press on to make it my own. And that's a supercharged effort he's talking about there. So, simple question as we wrap it up today. Are you really bringing to the Christian life this kind of a supercharged effort? Is it kind of ho-hum, oh me, oh my, business as usual? Or are you really getting it on and getting it going? And I ask myself that question too. So I simply ask you, dear ones, today this question, will you commit to aiming higher than what you are right now? Don't aim low. Aim high. Aim high. Go for gold. Aim for a perfect lifestyle. A song I used to hear sung a lot at an English Keswick was this one I'm going to quote now. We're going to have to learn it one of these days, Steve. It captures, I think, what we've been talking about. And in a minute, you're going to put it up on the screen, aren't you? Just when I get to it. Listen to the words carefully, would you? Not I but Christ, be honored, loved, exalted. Not I but Christ, be seen, be known, and heard. Not I but Christ, in every look and action. Not I but Christ, in every thought and word. And then the chorus goes like this. Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in Thee. Oh, that it may be no more I, but Christ that lives in me. Striving for moral perfection. That's what Jesus said we have to do. And I want to say this. If we're not doing it, you need to question whether you're a Christian or not. Seriously. May we pray. Our Father, we pray that this would be our prayer today. Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in Thee. Oh, that it may be no more I, but Christ that lives in me, aiming high for perfect lifestyle. Our Father, bring that about in our lives. It'll make a difference in the way we handle things and handle life and handle everything when that's true. When it's, as it were, we're married to a lover, Christ that satisfies us more than anything else in all this world. In his name, amen.